Hello there, welcome to Nerd World. And another top six video. In this one, we're doing the top six TV series villains, the scariest villains from different horror and sci fi series, fantasy series, whatever that I could think of. Before we get started, if you like this video or any other video, please like, share, and subscribe as I really need the views and the likes at the moment as I want my channel to keep growing. With that said, let's get started. First in, at our number 6 spot, are the Borg from the Star Trek franchise. Now I know superficially people don't immediately think of Star Trek as having say the scariest villains, but kind of hear me out on these guys, I mean they're, they're nightmare fuel. Now imagine these things rocked up to your planet one day. They just materialize out of thin air. A race of the, the half-dead cybernetically enhanced automatons announcing that, you know, rejoice, you're about to become one of us. You'll think like us. You won't really think at all, but you'll be one of us. You'll walk like us, talk like us, behave like us. You'll know only what we think you need to know. You'll never be able to determine your own destiny again. You'll be trapped in your own head, inside your own body, controlled by an ethereal consciousness beyond your own ability to comprehend. You're nothing more than a mindless drone, one voice amongst countless trillions just drowned out in the endless noise. You have no will, no self-determination, no choice. Your life is as disposable as a as, as, as a staple. That's about as about much equivalent value that the Borg hold to a single drone. And if you don't measure up to their standards, if you're physiologically or intellectually inferior, they won't even bother to assimilate you, but they don't just leave you, they'll just they'll just vaporize you because if they allow your species to survive, any of you, that means that your species will continue to resist the Borg and resistance is futile. They don't want to leave resistance, so they'll just destroy you. They've assimilated whole civilizations, countless trillions of individuals. No one is born a Borg. The Borg don't reproduce that way. On their endless strive for perfection, they assimilate other civilizations and other individuals, starships, pretty much anything they come across that they think might help them on their quest to become perfect. Races, for example, such as the Kazon were deemed unworthy of assimilation because they were intellectually, physiologically and technologically inferior and would the Borg would not benefit from their assimilation, but humanity, mentally and physically, were of interest to them, but technologically and sociologically we were highly evolved and the Borg wanted that evolution, they wanted it as part of their culture. Effectively you are made a willing slave to the collective consciousness, as well as at the same time becoming a part of that consciousness. And you're effectively immortal, so there's no end to this. And although it's often seen that drones seem to die pretty quick on screen, the real realism is most Borg drones will regenerate from the injuries that they receive from even the most powerful weapons, the phasers, disruptors. Remember, they're body armored and they're full of nanites that just regenerate them. They might go down, but they'll probably get back up again. So you don't even have the sweet release of death, not to mention that everything you knew, everything you were, becomes forever part of the Borg. So even if your physical body dies, there is in some form a continuation of who you were within the collective consciousness forever. An eternal torment, if I ever heard one. This next race, occupying our number 5 spot, are the Hive, from the series Dark Skies. This was a late 90s horror sci-fi series, a little bit in the vein of the X-Files. Now, it um, used to I used to watch this and they, these creatures used to really unnerve me. They're basically an alien parasite which will infest your body and take over your mind and take control of you. It makes you one of them, 
I know this sounds very similar to the <coughs> cold, but the Dark Skies, well, it lives up to his name. The show was a little darker. He didn't have the light-hearted tone that sometimes Stargate had, and as much as the idea of the Goa'uld are pretty much exactly the same, and they're both nightmare fuel, the Hive were more sinister. They were more insidious. They were more subtle. They weren't egomaniacal parasites playing god over humanity. These were just pure, out-and-out -out conquerors. They'd first infested an alien species we know as the Grey, who are the stereotypical little grey aliens with the big heads and big eyes. They'd invaded and taken over their civilization. The reason these things were coming to Earth in the first place was because of the Hive, not because they themselves wanted to come. And they were infiltrating human organizations, human governments, corporations, uh, federal agencies, you name it. They were taking them over and slowly, cautiously, quietly taking control of the human race from behind the scenes. Well, this one agency known as Majestic covertly tried to eliminate this problem and as well as keep it all covered up. But again, the idea of your body being taken over, your mind being possessed, trapped inside your own head, inside your own body, unable to influence your own movements, make your own decisions, watch yourself kill your friends, your family, your civilization be destroyed at your own hands and be powerless to stop it. I can't imagine a fate worse than that. Death sounds better. And these things, when I was younger and I used to watch this show, they were literal nightmare fuel for me. The next villain on our list would have been higher as he was he was just bloody awesome in the first season. But after that, it was a major decline in quality. But if you just watched the first season, this guy was intimidating and had a hell of a screen presence. And that that's saying something for a guy with no head. Obviously, this is the Headless Horseman from Sleepy Hollow. As a movie villain, he was great. But in a TV series, he was bloody fantastic. And they did his character so well in Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow Season 1 is so worth a watch, but there's a major decline in the series quality after that. Getting off topic. The Headless Horseman was a very intimidating presence. A obviously decapitated man wielding an axe, riding a great black steed, charging at you down the road, slicing off heads as he comes. It's a terrifying visage and it's, it's visceral. It takes you back to sort of the primitive roots of war in the past. The Headless Horseman is a supernatural being who's invulnerable, incredibly strong, and won't stop. If you are his target, he's just gonna he's gonna keep coming and coming and coming, and because you can't kill him, he's already dead or half dead or generally supernatural, he can't be destroyed. You can bat him back, you can outrun him for a while, but how long can you outrun? an undead supernatural entity that doesn't have to rest or sleep and is determined to kill you. Next on our list, our nightmare fuel if you're afraid of spiders, the Spinatod from Grimm. Now if you've never seen Grimm, I don't know what you've been doing. I don't know how you could have missed it. That show was fantastic. It's finished now. It was, it was great and had a plethora of different sort of really dark vessel I could have chosen but I went with the spinatar just because you know I don't particularly like spiders so you know they're scary and they're evil and they're servants of the devil so yeah spinatards the spinatards are a race of vessel which are basically sort of near human creatures somewhat supernatural they have an ability to vulgar which means that they can shapeshift between being human in appearance or their sort of animalistic traits which are those of a spider. Now in the case of the Spinatod species, which are a relatively rare vessel, as stated by other characters in the show, they are, as I say, spider-like. Now the females are dominant. The males don't display anywhere near the same level of aggression or physicality as the females. The females are considerably stronger than the males 
although it's likely the males hunt and kill in the same sort of way, they don't have to instinctively do it in the same way. Female spinatards go through a process every five years of shedding their skin, whereas the males don't. If the females don't shed their skin, their skin will begin to crack and age, giving the appearance of premature aging in the spinatard. Although it is unknown if this aging is genuine aging or if it's just a superficial appearance that they look older. One spinatard encountered who'd managed to resist shedding her skin, and I'll get to why she had to resist in a moment, looked like she was about 70 years old, but she was actually 26. As I said, it's unknown whether internally she was genuinely about 70 years old or whether it was just a superficial change. But these instincts kick in at about the age of 13. And at that point, their instinct to kill really ramps up. And they are, they're instinctually drawn to either a male, another male vessel, whether it be a spinatod or some other species, or a human. Doesn't really matter as long as it's a male. They'll mate with this individual. They will then kill them. And they will bite them and inject them with... Uh, no, not bite them. They'll basically regurgitate a sort of digestive enzyme directly into their victim's mouth after they've copulated. This will dissolve their innards and liquefy it into a more absorbable protein. They will then bite the abdomen and drink the liquid directly out of the body using basically some of their lovely little spider fangs that they grow when they need to do it. In doing this, this gives them the energy and the fuel they need to break their outer skin layer and basically shed their skin. And this allows them to emerge with a new healthy layer and they have to do this once every five years, which explains why there aren't a great deal of male spinatods around. That's pretty much every time they mate with a female every five years, she'll kill them. Now, the females don't enjoy doing this. It's an instinctive act. Some of them are able to resist it, but the majority don't resist it and they are forced to do it. They show remorse both before and after the event, often being as nice to the man as possible, basically giving him the night of his life before it's the last night of his life. But they, as I said, have to do this their whole lives, approximately every five years, which the way they kill you and why they kill you is pretty terrifying. And these things are pretty horrific in appearance with their deep black eyes, their sort of proboscis fangs coming out of their mouths and general spider-like appearance and behavior. They can scale walls, they're incredibly strong and are generally instinctively going to eat you. Nightmare fuel. I knew spiders were evil. In at our number two spot we've got the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who. I know I, I put these guys at the top of my list of Doctor Who villains and they deserve to be there. Doctor Who did these guys so well they're bleeding terrifying. They they only move when you're not looking at them so literally you blink and boom they're there. Blink again, boom they're closer. Blink again you've been zapped back in time 40 years and you live out the rest of your life to death. Basically that's how they kill you. They're the nicest psychopaths in the galaxy which is one of my favorite quotes in Doctor Who. They kill you without killing you. But the way they move, the way they operate, that their creepy little smile they get on their face when they're about to move, when they're about to come for you. These guys really genuinely scared me a little bit when I, was, when I first saw them in the episode Blink. Now, as I said, I know I put these guys at the top of my list and my favorite Doctor Who villains, so I'm not going to go too much into them. I'll try and remember to link the video either down below or in a little card or something. I don't really know where I'm going to put it yet. So I'm not going to go too much into them, but if you've never watched Doctor Who, I'm not saying you have to, but watch Blink. You should watch Blink. It, it's actually scary. And there isn't actually a lot of the um, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff, although that is the episode of that quote and that little Doctor Who phrase comes from. In at our number one spot, we've got The Gentleman from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, one of my favorite horror fantasy series of all time. 
and I'm surprised I've not done more videos on it. I've been kind of saving it because it's such a big franchise, such a big world that I don't even know where to begin. But when I was thinking about villains from TV, like ones that are actually kind of scary, my girlfriend, she turned around to me and she was like, the gentlemen have to be on this list. They've always scared her. And she almost refuses to watch the episode of Buffy that they're in. That's how much of an impact they had on her. They're only in one episode. They're not like the vampires that are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. The gentlemen were only in one episode. These guys are like undertakers who glide and float across the ground. They make absolutely no noise and they have this big, devilish, disturbing grin and wide eyes. And they have these little servant demons in straight jackets and they basically break into your house they take away everyone's voice beforehand because they can't stand any nat loud natural sound and they come out at night and they they break in and they applaud each other while they dissect you alive removing your heart and you can't scream for help no one can hear you the creepy little dudes in the straight jackets restrain you and hold you down there's no anesthetic i mean these guys are demons after all they delight in your pain and your torture. And the only way to kill them is to let out a scream that you can't generate because they've taken away your voice. Their appearance, their movements, everything. Amazing. And it was it's a standout episode that Josh Whedon did as an experiment. He did an episode with practically no sound. There's almost no music in it either. Like even ambient sound is all reduced and subdued. The episode keeps you with its atmosphere and its tension building. And a certain amount of just general creep factor from the villains that he uses and it's a masterpiece in in theater on television it's really well made and kind of scary so there's the number one the gentleman and the plus my girlfriend told me they had to be number one i couldn't put them anywhere else on this list she'd have killed me cut my heart out most likely she ginger anyway that's the end of this video. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe. Head over to my other channel, Nerd World Films. I hope you remember to put a link in the description or somewhere to go to that. And bye-bye.